Cicero, in defense of Sextus Roscius of Ameria, 80 BCE, part four, translated by Michael Grant, narrated by Max Layton. But I will leave all that aside. What I want to ask you instead is this. You yourself emphasize that my client was not accustomed to see very much of his fellow human beings, then I must insist that you identify the man who were his instruments in this terrible crime that you allege he committed, apparently in conditions of total secrecy, while he himself was far away. I can see that there can on occasion be charges which, although unjustified, are at least based upon facts that have given genuine grounds for suspicion, but in the present circumstances, in the present case, it is so wildly unlikely that you could find grounds for the smallest suspicion that if you manage to do even as much as this, I really believe that I should be prepared to admit at once that my client was guilty. The elder Sextus Roscius is murdered at Rome when his son is in the neighbourhood of Emeria. I suppose we are to ask and believe that the younger Roscius, who knew no one at Rome, conveyed instructions to some assassin there. Yes, you tell us he is sent for some individual to carry a message, but who did he send for? And when? He dispatched a messenger. But who was it? And who was supposed to be the recipient of the message? He persuaded someone using bribery, influence, expectations, promises. But really, such imputations are so implausible that it is hard to see how anyone could bother to produce them at all, even as blatant fabrications. And yet this is a terribly serious matter, involving nothing less than the dreadful charge of parricide. The other alternative would have been for my client to employ slaves to commit the crime. But when this allegation is made in pity's name, it places him in a truly lamentable and catastrophic situation. For what has happened is this. Usually when charges of this kind are brought forward, an innocent man is allowed to save himself by offering his slaves for examination by torture. But Sextus Roscius has not been permitted to adopt such a course, and the reason why this has not been permitted is perfectly clear. It is because you, his prosecutors, have seized possession of every one of his slaves. Out of all of his large household, the younger Sextus Roscius has not even been left with so much as one single boy to bring him his daily meal. Publius Scipio, Marcus Metellus, I appeal to you both to help me. When your support has been enlisted on Roscius's behalf and you were giving him your assistance, you can confirm that he has several times requested his opponents to provide two of his father's slaves in order to put them to torture. Do you not remember that Roskies refused? Well, where are those slaves now? Gentlemen, they are on Chrysogonus' staff. That's where they are. And he thinks a lot of them and values them highly. Yet, even now, I again put forward a demand that they should be examined. And my client begs and entreats that this demand should be granted. It seems to me incomprehensible that you can bring about yourselves to request such a request, to reject such a request. <clears throat> All right, go on feeling uncertain, gentlemen, about who killed Sextus Roscius, if you can bring yourselves to believe that this is a tenable attitude. Ask yourselves if the culprit is really like to be the man whose father's death plunged himself into poverty and peril, the man who is actually being prevented from inquiring into the circumstances in which his father died, or should the guilt not, rather, be attached to the people who shun the investigation, the individuals who are in possession of the dead man's property? There are the murderers living on the proceeds of the murder. But I will come back to this point again quite soon, for it concerns Magnus and Capto, and I promise to speak of their monstrous dealings. Once I finish refuting the charges put forward by Erucius. However, Erucius, I have not quite finished with you yet. If you, my client, if my client is really implicated in the crime, you will no doubt agree with me either that he committed it with his own hand, though in fact you admit he didn't, or that he got other people to do it for him, and if so, they must have been either free men or slaves. So let's first consider if they could have been free men. But it's completely beyond your powers to explain how he can manage to admit them, or how he persuaded them, or where, or through what intermediaries, or by raising what hopes, or by offering what bribes, I, on the other hand, am able to prove not only that Sextus Roscius did none of these things, but that he could not conceivably have done them, since he had been not in Rome for many years, and indeed had never even left his farm at all, unless there was some pressing reason to do so. So the only course you have left, clearly, is to begin saying he acted through slaves. 
At first, this looks like a haven where you could find refuge after all your other attempts to raise suspicion had ended in enforced retreat. But instead, you've struck a rock, and so now you see the charge rebounding off Sextus Roscius altogether. Something else is happening as well, for you are beginning to realise all the suspicions are reconciling upon yourselves. Well then, let's see where the prosecutor, embarrassed by his lack of argument, has gone to earth. The times in which we were living, he says, were so hazardous that it was quite common for people to be murdered with complete impunity. Consequently, since there were lots of such murders about, it was perfectly possible for Sextus Roscius to have committed the crime without encountering the slightest difficulty. But, sometimes, Erucius, you remind me of the sort of man who tries to obtain a couple of articles for a single payment, because on the one hand you are trying to drown us in a mass of legal proceedings, and then at the very same time you are contriving to make the most damning admissions about the very people who have been your paymasters. For you've been suggesting that people were being murdered on all sides. Now, if that's so, one can't help asking where the murderers were and who were the intermediary trees they used. In this connection, I'm surprised you don't seem to remember the people who brought you here were purchasers of confiscated property themselves and cut purses of that type, who flourished so exceedingly during the times we were discussing, the very often cutthroats as well. Here were people who day after day and night after night rushed about and brandished swords, never once leaving Rome, looting and killing all the time. It really does seem outrageous that people of this kind should have the nerve to blame the misery and cruelty of times upon the younger Sextus Roscius, and imagine the proliferation of assassins of whom they themselves were the leaders and chiefs. Can somehow be made into an argument which encompasses his ruin. For one thing, he was not even at Rome, and second, he didn't possess the slightest knowledge of what was happening there because, as you yourself admit, he was a man who never left the countryside. However, if I go on elaborating what is perfectly obvious, you'll begin to find it boring, gentlemen, I'm afraid, or I shouldn't seem to be underestimating your intelligence. So may I just express my conviction that Erucius' charge has been made utterly disproved, unless perhaps you are waiting to hear me refute his imputations of embezzlement and other purely fictitious charges of the same kind which were never mentioned at all before today, and have now been introduced as complete novelties. Erucius seemed to me to be reciting them out of some speech altogether, concocted against some quite different victim, so wholly were these points irrelevant both to the accusations of parasite and to the defendant who is my client. They are the only bare assertions, unsupported by argument, and another bare assertion will be quite enough to deny them. And if what prosecutor has in mind and if what the prosecutor has in mind is to keep something back for cross-examination of witnesses, what has happened just now will happen again. Once more, he will find us better prepared than he has ever expected. I now come to a matter which gives me no particular pleasure to talk about, but my duty to my client demands that I should bring it up all the same. If I enjoy being an accuser, there are other people I should prefer to accuse, engaging in cases that would advance my career. But this... I have decided not to do, as long as the option remains open to me. The real respect is earned by improving one's reputation, by one's own merit, not by climbing upon the distresses and disasters of someone else. However, the time has now come for us to cease for a while examining baseless slurs. It's necessary now to look for the crime where it really exists and can be found. In the process, at Lucius, you'll learn what a genuine accusation really is. You will find that it is a charge supported by a host of convincing circumstances. However, I don't propose to mention the whole lot of these circumstances, and I shall be quite brief in my treatment of each successive point. Indeed, I wouldn't touch on all of them unless I had to, and I shall prove my reluctance by not pursuing these matters only one single step, <coughs> single step further than my safety of my client and my own duty demand. Against Sexus Roskius, you found no possible motive, but I found one in Magnus. I am afraid it is you that I have turned my attack, Magnus. You leave me no alternative, because you are actually sitting with the prosecutors and declaring your hostility quite openly. We'll see about Capita later on, if he comes forward as a witness, and I understand he is ready to do so. When he appears, he will be told about some triumphant achievement of his, which he doesn't even expect. 
that has ever heard it. When the famous Lucius Cassius Longinus Gravida, regarded by the Romans as a judge possessing flawless integrity and wisdom, who was presiding at a trial, he always used to ask the same question. Cui bono? Who benefited by what was done? And such a question is very realistic. No one attempts to commit a crime unless he's hoping it will do him some good. As president of the bench and as judge, Cassius was avoided and dread dreaded by the prisoners on the dock, as although devoted to the truth, he did not seem to show much natural inclination towards mercy, being apparently disposed to severity instead. Today, however, our president is a man whose determined opposition to violence is only equalled by his resolute support for every accused man who is innocent. All the same, I should have felt just as ready to defend my client even before the rigorous Cassius himself or other judges who are now described as Cassian after him, a designation which even now strikes defendants with terror. But this is a case in which the question, who benefited, cui bono, would not seem to judge worth seem to judges worth asking at all, for they could see with their own eyes that our opponents are in occupation of vast properties, but that my client is reduced to penury. penury. But being perfectly clear, they would be disposed to attach guilt and suspicion to those who had secured the loot, rather than the man who had lost everything he possessed. Besides, Magnus, you can't contradict me when I assert that hitherto you were poor, you were greedy, you were violent. And you're on extremely bad terms with the man who was murdered. Surely we don't have to look for any motive besides these to show that the man who committed the horrible deed was not my client, but yourself. All these facts were unquestionable. Your former state of destitution was too glaring to be concealed now. Indeed, efforts of concealment make it more conspicuous still. You show your greed by entering into a partnership with a complete stranger in order to gain possession of a fortune of a fellow townsman and a relation. As for your violence, it can be clearly appreciated, leaving everything else aside by the brazenness of your appearance here in this court. Out of all the conspirators, in other words, out of this entire gang of assassins, you alone have had the nerve to come here and sit right among our prosecutors, and not merely to show your shameless face, but to flaunt it before everyone else's eyes. And the fact that you were so thoroughly hostile to the dead man and you got involved and in very serious disputes with him about family affairs is something that you need not to deny. So, all we have to do is weigh up these two people, one against the other, and decide which of them is more likely to have murdered the elder Sextus Roscius. It is the man who became rich because of his death, or is it the man whom the event reduced to complete poverty? The man who had been poor before it happened, or the man who had become exceedingly poor afterwards? The man whose burning greed impelled him to assail his own kinsman, or the man whose way of life was such that all he knew about was the produce of his own agricultural labour, so that acquisitiveness meant nothing to him at all? The individual who grabbed confiscated goods with unrestrained savagery, or the person whose unfamiliarity with the forum and the court cases, to him dread not the sight of these benches, but of the very city itself, Finally, gentlemen, and this, in my opinion, is the most important question of all, the dead man's enemy or his son.